Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Stronger Together, Reconnecting with and Affirming Our Students, Families, and Communities. Both Inspire and Harmony host these webinars where thought leaders and educators share best teaching practices and tools to support social emotional learning. These presentations are the opinions and content of our guest speakers and may not necessarily be a direct representation of Harmony or Inspire. For best viewing of this webinar, it is recommended that you shut down your other browsers for today. Throughout today's discussion, we hope to make this a conversation among our panelists and all of you. Please use the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel to submit questions, contents, comments, sorry, or ponderings uh, for our guests. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording within the next week. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive a copy of the certificate of completion from GoToWebinar within 48 hours. You can also download a copy of the slide deck today under the handout tab on your GoToWebinar panel. Now, I'm thrilled to support this conversation today as your host. I'm Lauren Pusen, the National Director for Harmony SEL. I have the honor and privilege of working with our incredible, passionate, and educated team at Harmony SEL to bring you resources, training, and tools to support your districts, organizations, and communities. One of my favorite parts of my job is to work with our incredible partners, such as the New York City DOE and Communities in Schools, who are really the people making a difference in the world of our children and are our guests for today's webinar. Shortly, I will turn the microphone over to our guest today. So let me get started with some introductions. And again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this dynamic discussion. All right, let's begin with Dr. Susan M. Green. Hi, Dr. Good Green. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you guys are. Hey, hey, hey. That's I'm right. So here. Thank you. Dr. Green has more than 20 years of experience committed to cultivating classroom and school cultures where both students, social and academic needs drive all her decision making, which you'll shortly witness um, as we have in our partnership with her. Dr. Green uh, currently works for the Central Division within the New York City Department of Education's Office of Safety and Youth Development as the Senior Administrator for Social Emotional Learning. Thank you, Dr. Green, for joining us and sharing with us your expertise today. Can't wait. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, and next, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Jessie Cuddy and Ms. Jacqueline Stedman from Communities and Schools, another incredible partner of Harmony SEL. Jessie is the Senior Director of Learning and Practice at Communities and Schools National Office. She leads the efforts to engage with, support, and optimize learning from the national network of CIS affiliates across the United States. Also joining us, we have Jacqueline Stedman, who joined the Communities and Schools National Office in June 2016. In her role as Senior Program Manager for Learning and Practice, she manages the design, creation, and implementation of learning initiatives for Communities and Schools Network. We're so lucky to witness the incredible work of Jesse and Jacqueline and how they keep their students front and center in the learning needs of their staff. Welcome, Jesse and Jacqueline. Thank you for having us. We're excited to be here. Fantastic. All right, now let's review our objectives for today's session. Okay. Today, we are here to rethink and refine strategies for connecting with students, families, and communities, 
particularly after this year of trauma, where so many experienced uh, as a result of COVID-19 and the disruptive schooling for many students this past year. Additionally, today we'll discover strategies to move from a deficit model to a strengths model in our interactions with students and families. And lastly, but definitely not least, we're here to understand the positive impacts of cultural humility and power sharing. Before we dig in, we'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So we are going to take a poll. And that comes up on your screen so we can understand a little bit more about your background. You can also share in the question box if you're not able to answer in the poll. So the question we have for today is what is your current position? Might you be a pre-K to 12th grade teacher, a district administrator, an after school provider, or a nonprofit leader? Or might you be uh, joining us in a different position? And welcome. We'll give you a moment to uh, add to your poll. Okay, we'll give you one more minute to go ahead and select right on your screen. We are having the votes coming in, or you can share in the question box. We're so excited to have such a diverse group here today. All right, Amy, let's go ahead and close the poll. Looks like the majority have responded. And I'll share out our responses. We have 29% are pre-K through 12th grade teachers. We have 5% are district administrators. We have 7% are after school providers. 7% are nonprofit leaders and 52% are others. So we have an eclectic group today. Thank you all for being here today. Fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate your time. We know it's a busy time of year. We're either starting school or about to. So really appreciate all your efforts and joining us today. So thank you for participating. All right. So we are here today to really have a discussion on being stronger together and how we can work on reconnecting with and affirming our students, our families, and our communities after the trauma so many people have faced as a result of COVID-19 and really the disruptive school year that we had. So let's start by hearing from our panelists about who they are and what do they focus on in their agencies. We'll start with Dr. Susan M. Green. Can you please share with us a little bit about yourself, the New York City DOE, and what you're up to as of late, Dr. Green? Certainly, thank you, Lauren. So uh, good afternoon and again, good morning to everyone. Thank you again for being here, for joining you, joining us, and I'm happy to be here with you. So I come to you uh, from the New York City Department of Education. I am a 22, 23 year veteran of the DOE. I uh, welcome my first grade colleagues. That's where I started my career. Shout out to all the first grade teachers. I have worked in uh, as an eighth grade ELA teacher. God bless all the middle school uh, people on here today because they are a different breed. And I have uh, spent 12 years working as a New York City public school principal in the village of Harlem, New York. And now uh, I have spent the last three years working in my current role with the Office of Safety and Youth Development within the Department of Education, a super awesome team. And so just to tell you a little bit about New York City, for those of you who have never been here, we serve 1.1 million students uh, across the five boroughs. So you will see there a map of New York City and its five boroughs. We have over 150,000 staff members. And while New York City is considered one major school district, we have 32 sub-districts within New York City and sub-school districts that service um, more than, or is comprised of more than 1,800 schools across um, the five boroughs. And so just to give you a little bit of demographic information about who we are, um, we are a, a melting pot, right, of, of people. And so just to give you a little bit of background, 13% 
of our students are English language learners. 20% of our student population um, are students with disabilities. We have 73% um, of our students come from impoverished communities. 40% of our population are um, listed as um, Latinx and 24% being black, 15, 16, close to 17% Asian and almost 15% are white. So just to give you a little bit of background around um, our, the thinking that goes into the design of the Department of Education, we come from what is called the framework for great schools. And the framework, uh, when we think about our great schools, we think about how every part of what we do, we want it to focus on student achievement. And so when we work our ways out, like out to, out to that, what does that look like, right? So one of the things we have to take into consideration, obviously, is that we want rigorous construction. We want collaborative relationships amongst our staff. We want our environments to be supportive. And all of this comes when we have effective school leadership and we have strong community ties. And all of this work is really embedded into trust. But our office, the Office of Safety and Youth Development, which rests under what we call the Division of School Climate and Wellness, we focus on the supportive environment work, right? So when we're thinking about everything that it takes to create a supportive environment for children, it goes well beyond the academics. You can be the best planner when it comes to curriculum, but if you do not have relationships with young people, then we are missing the mark and making sure that we actually really capitalize on the work that we wanna do for our young people. So, what we have established, the Division for School Climate and Wellness, are these four areas that encompass a supportive environment. So we look at supportive, su excuse me, safety and restorative approaches to behavior, collaborative and trusting relationships, equity and student voice. And I'm glad Laura mentioned that previously because the student voice piece is key when we're thinking about power. We want to empower our young people and lift their voices. And then physical and mental wellness, because we can never be our best selves if we do not um, take care of those parts of who we are as people. And so some of the initiatives that we have around that building that supportive environment framework is definitely beginning with, of course, our partnership with our people at Harmony. And I got to shout out my girl, Laura Johnson, because she and I work super closely together. She represents Harmony, I'm representing the DOE. And over the past two years, we have been able to bring the Harmony program to over 400 schools across New York City. And that's a lot. Um, we also have a, a tremendous amount of our middle and high schools and some of our elementary schools as well that have uh, rooted their work in restorative practices. We've had uh, multi-million dollars poured into the RJ work to really um, support our school staff in helping young people in building their voices and giving them spaces to be, to be heard and developing healthy ways in which we engage young people as opposed to resorting to punitive measures when it comes to managing student behavior. We have a comfort dog program. So yes, we have schools across New York City that actually have dogs in them. We have uh, an LG LGBTQ manager that oversees supports for um, affirming the members of our LGBT community and um, their allies, right? Um, because we want to ensure and recognize the fact that there are intersections and in how our children show up and, and every part of who they are is important. Our single shepherd program is designed to make sure that we give students who come from some of those areas that we mentioned earlier in the statistics to give them the additional support to make sure that they can achieve academically and socially. And then our multi-tiered uh, support services are the structures are ones that are important to our office to ensure that we are supporting schools holistically in the work that we're doing and recognizing that no one thing is the fix in supporting our children, but that it's, an, it's imperative that you bring the intersections of different supports in order to ensure that you are, uh, that we are best um, supporting our children to meet their needs and equipping them. And so briefly, and because I'll talk about this a little later, um, New York State has adopted um, 
uh, uh, created and adopted a framework around culturally responsive sustaining education and the four areas in which uh, this work um, we believe is important and the, the first one being most important to me is really the work of uh, creating welcoming and, infirm and affirming environments for our young people um, ensuring that in doing that that the work um, is inclusive uh, when it comes to the curriculum and, and how we assess our young people, um, looking at the high expectations and rigorous instruction. And then, of course, all of this work has to be embedded in ongoing professional learning and support. And so really just um, the, the New York City Department of Education and our office has been um, intentional in leading this work and professional learning for our schools and our districts because we recognize that we have to begin to have some honest conversations with ourselves and change the narratives in which um, we educate our children that we we have to really um, how do we say I guess walk the talk right in, in affirming our students and so this framework that's been designed by New York State is one of the things that we've used to help us with this work and so again I'll speak more about that later and I also want to speak about our healing, right, for, for all of us, because every one of us who is participating in this webinar, we have been forever changed by uh, this pandemic. And so New York City has what we um, call Thrive NYC. And just, you know, to frame New York City, New York City is a school district that does come under mayoral control. And so our mayor and the first lady of New York City um, in partnership with several city agencies, including the Department of Education, have partnered around really concentrating our efforts around mental health support services for all people, not just our young people, um, for every people in every entity and every fiber in which um, they show up, regardless of their roles and responsibilities. Because um, again, if our mental health is in check, and, and we recognize that this is a part of who we are. When we do this work for ourselves, we are better equipped to show up for the young people who need this support as well. And so later in my um, our presentation today, I'll speak a little bit more about our work around um, healing center schools and the, the outstanding and exciting work that we're doing to bring in um, all constituents and all stakeholders to be a part of um, this development. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Every time I hear you talk about New York City and your work, I learn something new. So thanks for introducing us to and helping us understand what you're doing uh, in New York City these days. Um, now um, we'll get a chance to hear from uh, Jesse and Jacqueline. Uh, we'd love to get to know a little bit more about your about communities and schools and the work that you're currently curating. So I'll hand over the mic to you. Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, I some really I'm inspired every time we get to talk with Dr. Green. So I'm excited to get into the meat and the conversation. So um, Jacqueline and I are, are thrilled to be here. Thank you, Harmony um, and Inspire, for having us today. We're excited to talk about the work of communities and schools and share a little bit more about who we are and how we're approaching this year of um, continued reengagement of our students, families, and communities as we sort of um, navigate whatever this new normal looks like. So um, if you want to advance to the next slide, I can tell you a little bit about who Communities and Schools is um, as an organization. And Jacqueline then will tell you a little about how we do our work and where. So Communities and Schools is a national organization that ensures every student, regardless of race, zip code, socioeconomic background, has what they need to realize their potential in school and beyond. Um, working directly inside 2,900 schools across the country, we connect students to caring adults and community resources that help them see, confront, and overcome the barriers that stand between them and a brighter future. Um, together, we build a powerful change movement made up of peers, students, um, and alumni committed to shaping an equitable path of education for future generations. Um, so the way we do that is by building relationships with students, their families, um, the communities that surround them and support, and particularly um, the adults inside the school building who are all there to make sure that barriers are removed for students to get to their unlocked potential. Um, next slide. Thank you. So again, our reach, we work in um, 25 or excuse me, 26 states and the District of Columbia. 
in 2,900 schools um, serving 1.7 million students. We do this by way of an affiliated network of nonprofit organizations, communities and schools of, um, and licensed partners. And so Jacqueline and I have the privilege of working at the CIS or Communities and Schools National Office, um, where our work really centers on elevating the work of the site coordinators and um, program managers out in our network of 120 organizations who are doing the work on the ground with students, families, and communities every day. Um, so our students nationwide, just to give you a snapshot, we'll talk a little bit more about data, why that's important and critical to our work of um, integrated student supports later in the presentation today. However, to give you a snapshot of the students that we serve, um, primarily students who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch, um, about a 50-50 split on gender here, just to give you an idea. And then in terms of race and ethnicity, the students that we serve um, are primarily um, black and brown students throughout the country. Um, so this has real serious implications as we have conversations throughout our network and as a national nonprofit organization around race equity, conversations, um, LGBTQ rights and um, advances. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how we address um, you know, student voice and student agency as well as family engagement through um, really the demographics of the communities that we serve um, later in the presentation today. So really thrilled to be able to share some of that with you. Um, next slide. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jacqueline to talk a little bit about, so I went pretty quickly, how who we are and how, how we operate. Um, and Jacqueline will tell you a little bit more about our model of integrated student supports um, over the last 40 plus years. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so as Jesse said, she, she shared a little bit about who we are. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we do our work um, as communities and schools. So as you can see on your screen on the left side, we really believe that our work is grounded in having strong relationships uh, with our students. So that's the basis of uh, the work that we do in schools. From there, we're able to work with the students to um, develop social, emotional, and academic competencies, those SEL skills um, that we all know are so important, uh, which then uh, drives improving attendance, behavior, and coursework, um, which we then believe leads to some of our outcomes, um, including reducing dropout rates, increased graduation rates, increased college and career readiness and civic engagement. Um, but again, it all starts with those strong relationships with our students, and that's really the foundation of our work. Next slide. Uh, on this page here, you can see uh, what we call our model. Um, so every year uh, with the communities and schools work, we start off by doing a needs assessment. And this is a school-wide needs assessment as well as um, individual needs assessments for each student that we work with. Uh, this really makes sure that we have a full understanding of the community, including um, what strengths and assets are there um, and where the needs really lie so that we are going in and trying to um, make a, a plan and then provide support, steps two and three, um, in the areas that will have the greatest impact. Um, and then uh, continuing on throughout the year, we continue to um, collect data and monitor and adjust that plan and, and the supports throughout the year so that, um, you know, as needs may change throughout the year or some things may work better than others. Um, so we're constantly, you know, assessing and making sure that we're serving the students and the schools and the communities in the best way that we can. Um, and then at the end of the year, you know, we kind of do an evaluation and take stock and see, um, and that then feeds into the plan for the next year. So that completes the circle and it, it continues year after year. Next slide, please. Thanks. So we also wanted to share just um, some of our, our results or our outcomes. Um, you can see on the slide um, a number of different areas, um, including the percentage that stayed in school and were promoted to the next grade or graduated. These are for our, our case managed students, so the students that we work with on a more intensive level um, with a group and individualized supports. Um, and so we, this is basically showing that we feel that you know, our theory of change and our model works um, and we're able to hopefully uh, support students in achieving many of these outcomes. All right, thanks, Lauren. Um, 
that was just a quick summary for CIS and I'll hand it back to you to get us going into the conversation. Great. Thank you both. Really appreciate uh, you sharing. I heard commonalities between Dr. Green and then Jesse and Jacqueline at Communities and Schools around uh, student success and student achievement and that really being a driver of a lot of the work that you do. And I also heard a lot about healthy relationships and building safe and secure spaces. So excited to dive in uh, and get to the juicy stuff of our conversation today. Maybe even your secret sauce that you want to share with us. Um, so we'll start. Uh, we'll start with why. So why do you do the work that you do? What's the motivator? What might be the engine? right, behind this incredible work that your agencies are doing. You have such incredible lifts that you're devoting time and resources and energy to. So we'd love to hear more about your why. So Jesse and Jacqueline, let's start with you this time. Great, um, yeah, happy to start with our why. And, and really at the center of that model Jacqueline shared is that site coordinator. So there's a person inside every each one of those um, 2,900 schools who is responsible for really developing those relationships with students on a one on one level, but also the other adults in the building um, to help them optimize their work with the students, whether they're the teacher or the custodial staff or the principal, how can that site coordinator be supporting the other adults in the building who all are there for the common mission of getting those students equipped for life beyond um, K-12, right? And so um, really our why starts with relationships. Bill Milliken is the founder of Communities and Schools. Over 40 years ago, he started his work kind of on the streets of Harlem, working directly with students um, who were at risk of or had already dropped out of school. And so relationships, um, something he commonly has been quoted to say is, um, you know, programs don't change students' lives, but relationships do. And so it really starts there for us in our work. Um, and it starts with that relationship built between that site coordinator working inside the school building with students and their families. Um, and so integral to relationships really being successful are um, those developmental assets and developmental relationship elements um, that help foster really healthy um, relationships between a student and their site coordinator. And so for us, we really focus on things like sharing power, um, challenging growth, but also expressing care and providing support, all elements from the developmental relationships framework, which we fully adopted as an organization. So over the last 40 years, we've really started with a concept of relationships make the biggest difference in students' lives, and then back that up with evidence and science to really equip our site coordinators um, with both the knowledge and also the intuition that what they're doing really works. So we see that if, if I had to pick an engine behind what works for communities and schools, you know, programs are great. We always want to stay evidence-based. We frequently are using the Harmony curriculum um, as an SEL support, but without those relationships being really the foundation of those connections between both students and their families, um, a lot of that can fall flat for a student. So really understanding that student's motivator, um, tapping into that student's agency, whether they're in pre-K or about to graduate, understanding what their goals are for themselves can make a huge impact in how successful that student is ultimately um, in reaching and achieving those goals. So for us, it's all about relationships. Well, we love hearing that, um, especially at Harmony, right? Um, where everything we say begins with healthy relationships. So uh, thank you for sharing that. It's really inspirational to think about the way that your founder really started that element of work and it's lived through with evidence-based practices and so on so that you can really equip your staff to do a wonderful job. So Thank you for sharing your why. It really helps us understand really the values behind your work too and the foundation. So Dr. Green, tell us your why. I swear, Jesse, I was I was about to speak over Laura, girl, but lucky I had the mic on. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I know, that's right. Just to, you know, I, I and I, I echo what you said just in terms of our preparation for, for today's webinar, you know, just the vibes and the energies that we got off of one another. And um and where we paralleled and and so yeah just to continue to, to build off of that it's the the idea i think also for us at the department of education um and specifically our unit with the division of school climate and wellness and the office of safety and youth development we really saw the need for us to do a shift in the atmosphere in terms of how we see our kids 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, really having those those difficult conversations internally um, and creating the structures around um, why do we discipline the way we do, right? What have we been conditioned to believe about young people, about student voice, about who the haves and the have nots should be? And um, really taking a step back and trying to strip the layers of that on those onions and having those um, conversations um, not only as individuals, but as an organization to really ask ourselves, what are the structures um, that we have and the ones that we don't have in place that contribute to what we say we want for all students? And so for us, we have really um, done um, a lot of work that I'm proud of as a member of this particular office. Um, as far as shifting our focus around building more student voice and echoing what you said about empowering student voice. And so really put in, in um, intentional structures in place. We have um, a great partnership with um, our youth council. There's a youth council division within the New York City, um, within New York City. And then so having youth councils across our schools um, that focus on different areas that where we are actually um, allowing students to inform us about what their needs are and what their desires are, as opposed to us telling them, this is what you need and this is how it needs to happen. And so that vulnerability that it takes to be an adult or to be a leader and to actually relinquish that power and give it to young people to have to take a step back and say, feed me, inform me, tell me what this should look like is I think one of the greatest ways um, in which we have begun to make that shift. Um, just reflecting on the data, we recognize that um, our uh, disciplinary uh, measures were ones that needed some addressing because we found that um, our black children and specifically our black boys um, were the targets of um, substantially more suspensions than their peers of other um, ethnic subgroups. And then you take that in the intersection and you look at students with disabilities, you look at students in temporary housing, right? And the, 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 just this um, stark contrast in the ways in which this population of people, so people who are already coming with, um, from disenfranchised populations with so many barriers already stacked against them. And then now because of our makeup and how we've been conditioned to believe the ways in which we're supposed to engage young people um, when we don't always afford them the, the opportunity to just be young people, right? You know, I mean, if, 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 we, if we're honest about the work, right, and we look specifically at some of those populations, we have to say to ourselves that black and brown children are not always afforded the same opportunity and luxuries of being young, of being their age. They're seen four and a half, five times older than their actual age. And so, when we don't afford them that opportunity and we expect them to be men and women when they're 13 and 12 and 10 years old, right? That's a, that's, we got a problem, right? And so the work is not about the kids, the work is about us and how we see them. And so there's a lot of work that we've been doing around um, relationship building. And so for our elementary school um, population, Harmony has been great in providing a curriculum to help teachers in supporting that work. Um, the RJ initiatives have been um, instrumental in helping us to give space where there's no leader, right? Because we're all sitting in a circle, right? And if I have the talking piece, then what I say matters, right? And that my experiences are, are not debatable and giving adults an opportunity to actually be the learners, right? And to have those internal conversations to say, you know what? I didn't always have it right, but I want to get it better for the sake of doing this work. So I'm gonna stop right there, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> That's what this conversation is for. Our why should be emotional, it should drive us, I hope every day to wake up and do this hard work. Um, Dr. Green, you just shared some incredible, uh, some incredible things about empowering student voice and refreshing in a way that like, we're really listening to you, right? We see that, 
maybe you're not always able to be a student of your age. Maybe you're seen to be older and that's not necessarily fair for our students, right? So you, I, I just really appreciate the way you and such a huge Department of Education is thinking about, again, those students first and um, and listening to them. So we'll dig in to this topic a little further. So I'll stop adding my commentary because what we really, what we would love to hear next is from our audience. We would love to hear from you. What is your why? What drives you? What drives your organization? Uh, to, to really make this a better place for our kids to succeed uh, in, in your organization, in the systems that you run, in the classrooms that you're a part of. What are you doing and what is your why? So we'll give you a moment to add that. And Jesse, Dr. Green, Jacqueline, anything you want to share with one another about what you just said? I was like, if Dr. Green and I can just have our own, you know, where I interview her and ask her questions, I, I'm so lit up about what you're talking about. I think that this, the opportunities and the intentionality around handing students the microphone, right? Not holding it for them, not saying fill this, but I want, we want to hear from you. You have a seat at the table is so powerful because they don't, nobody knows their experience like them. And so even if that experience can be kind of painful at a district level or even organizational level of, ooh, we've, we've done some unintentional harm with our students, um, that's, that's powerful messaging. And to then get to see adults take action based on that feedback is so affirming to students, right? I mean, it's giving them the dignity they deserve. And not only are we going to hand you the mic, we're going to listen to you. And then we're going to make change because of it. And we want you to be a part of the change. I just think there's so much power in that. And even just enabling a student to see their future where their voice does matter. That beyond K-12, like you can have a seat at a table and really equipping them to, to do that work. How do we empower them? How do we tap into what they do know how to do and how to you know advocate for themselves and in areas where they want to grow too? I think that's really powerful and exciting work that you all are doing. Um, and it's it happens on the individual level, right? Like being able to mm -hmm. tap into different students willing to kind of step forward and, and share their voice. It's, it's Jesse, I, you know, it's, I, I have to tell you like, and they're not coming with supervis superficial ideas, right? On the types of changes. Like they are talking about real things that blow my mind away and things that sometimes we as adults are not even thinking about like because sometimes we're so linear and we're and we're just kind of like right here and where we're trying to focus our attention and they are looking from the aerial view they are the ones that are on the balcony looking down at the dance floor and you know we think that we're all already you know <laughs> looking down at the dance floor and they like boo it's one more tier above you right. and they're really seeing things from a from a different lens um that really becomes you know um, eye opening, you know, and, and just jaw drop dropping. And so, um, and I'm glad that you mentioned about it's, it's not just about hearing them, but the, the affirmation of the action, right? And here's the support and the structure and the backing that I'm going to put behind you because I see why this is important. And so, just even for, you know, us just briefly mentioning how the mental health work, right? That the expansion that we have done, we have the, the the Chancellor Student Advisory Council and these young people came up with some really great ideas on how we can affirm um, young people and as allies, right? Who might be struggling with mental health and through their voices and their recommendations, we've had external community-based organizations come and want to fund, right? their project on, on you know, a multi-million dollar level that now we are expanding training for everybody around this work. So for young people to be able to say, I was a part of that. I remember when we developed that and we proposed that. That's the, you know, that's the work that we don't hear enough about, but that is so important. So thank you for lifting that up. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this is why this is such a dynamic discussion. I love us jumping in. Amanda, do we have any whys that you'd like to read out from our audience? We'd love to learn more about them. Yes, we have our audience chiming in and sharing similar thoughts that you have expressed today. Helping students that feel lost in the gap and their feelings. Mm -hmm. My why is to help and empower the students where they are at. Help students who are struggling <clears throat> to learn due to gaps in SEL to close gaps or learn strategies to help them be successful. 
My why is building relationships and confidence in their selves. Mm. Mm, beautiful. I think this is such a motivator for us as we really get started in this school year and uh, really bring ourselves back to why are we all at the table. Um, so let's keep going. We have more juicy topics to get to. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so our next topic is really about understanding and affirming your communities. So Dr. Green, let's start with you. So what are some intentional practices you're taking into account when understanding your data? So this could be both quantitative or qualitative um, to understand and affirm your communities. Thank you, Laura. So yeah, so you know, as I mentioned, you know, momentarily or a few a few moments ago, excuse me, um, with regards to you know our suspension practices was you know one of the the areas in which we had to um, acknowledge that there was work that we needed uh, to do, right? And it's not just about figuring out like okay, well, what's a different punitive approach that I could take, you know, in lieu of a suspension, but it was really about this uh, relationship work. And so one of the things that we also have in place in the Department of Education is that we do student experience surveys, right? Where we, um, or student environment surveys, where we get to hear from young people about their experience in their school setting, what their relationships are like with the adults in their community. Do they feel safe emotionally and physically within their community? And utilizing this data to for schools to actually make informed decisions about their school's mission, what they are doing that's working, what's not working, how do they make the modifications um, that they need. Um, when we think holistically about our most vulnerable populations and some of the struggles that they have experienced within the school communities. Um, and then now looking at how COVID is now uh, further impacting that, right? And, and uh, making what was already a challenging situation even that much greater. Um, one of the things that we have been doing is really paying closer attention to the partnerships that we have been formulating. And I think it's important to mention that this work is not work that we can um, do on our own as an organization. So I love hearing Jesse and Jacqueline speak about how they partner, right, with other organizations to help do the heavy lifting of the work. And so in the Department of Education, you know, we, we partner um, strategically with some community-based organizations, with leaders in this work, um, to help us understand how to show up for 1.1 million children and 150,000 people and all of these families. And so one of our partnerships has been with um, the University of Chicago with their Trauma and Responsive Education Practice Project to really teach us about tangible strategies and, and resources that we can use to welcome staff back to, to school, welcome students back in their families, um, and really doing the work of um, trying to not only hear what experiences experiences have been, but to, to work on the healing, right, of our communities. I think one of the things that I love about this work is that they are not focusing exclusively on school leaders and teachers, right? This is work for all adults who are part of the community because children are coming in contact with every person. They're coming in contact with the cafeteria staff. They're coming in contact with the, cust the custodial staff. They're coming in contact with the crossing guard. There's all of these people that they're coming in contact with. And then guess what? Particularly now, all of these people that they're coming in contact with have been impacted by this pandemic, have been impacted by this um, most recent social unrest and all of these things that are happening historically now, right, in this short span of time over the past 18 months. And so all of these people need to have space where they can um, work on being healed and, and be able to speak about their trauma. Our custodians have never had any days off, right? So there has been no work from home, right, when you're operating a building. We have, you know, we, in New York City, we had rec centers, what we call these regional education centers, so that 
um, first responders could actually send their children to these places, right? So they could go to work, right? So you have people who have operated this that have never had a day off and yet they're still dealing with their own trauma. So we're wanting to make sure that we're intentional about providing that type of support. So we have this bridge to school plan that's available for all of our schools um, to ensure that they have strategies and, and, and um, resources to welcome kids back. Um, again, just reiterating this work around culturally responsive, sustainable education, right? And looking at those pillars in which we want to show up for our young people. And I always go back to the affirming work because if we can really root ourselves in that work and relinquish the biases that we hold, right? Um, that we hold in, in the ways in which we think young people should show up, the way that we think young people should look and how they should behave. And if we can kind of relinquish that and then actually give space for for them to show up with all of these intersections of who we all are, right? Because we want people to accept us for who we are, but then we want to put restrictions on, on how other, other people show up. But if we give the space for them to be able to do that, and then looking deeper at our curriculum, right? A curriculum that nationally has really been rooted in white societal norms, right? But that wasn't necessarily designed for the people that we serve. You see our, our data is, you know, in terms of our student population for our black and brown um, community is over 65%, right? But yet we don't necessarily design curriculum that encompasses all of who they are. Right. And we're not just, you know, we're past the days of saying we're going to have, you know, uh, tacos for Cinco de Mayo. OK, we are talking about the real work. Right. Of children showing up to school and they're saying that this is my home away from home because I can see myself. Right. And what the people look like and what the curriculum looks like in the conversations that we have and that um, nobody's trying to squelch. Right. My culture right my traditions and that these things matter and so we partnered with goldie muhammad who has been just so vital in um in opening our eyes in the new york university metro center and helping us to really rethink about how do we revise our curriculum in a way that gives um affirmation to all people not just a select group of people that we want them to conform to what's um, pre-existing as opposed to saying you know what let's restructure what's been pre-existing in a way that makes sure that everybody has a seat at the table that's um right. that's i'll stop right there <laughs> <laughs> thank you dr green what i really love you hearing about and basically what you just shared with us you brought to life cultural humility and power sharing, which is something we really wanted to highlight today through um, understanding and affirming everyone who they are and, and how they show up. And um, in power sharing, again, you provided so many great examples of partnering and working with your community. So thank you for sharing those. Jacqueline and Jesse, what do you wanna add about what Communities and Schools is doing and your intentional practices to take into account your data? There you go, Jack. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to add just a few things to uh, all of the great practices that Dr. Green shared. Um, you know, when you when you talked about kind of sharing power with students, that's something um, that we've really tried to focus on over the past few years. Um, you know, as you mentioned, partnerships are really important for us as well. We've partnered with the Search Institute. Um, which is an organization who has um, done some research and come up with what they call the developmental relationships framework. Um, and this is basically evidence-based backing to um, building relationships with young people. Um, so they have defined five elements of a developmental relationship, um, express care, challenge growth, provide support, share power, and expand possibilities. And what we found in a lot of the communities and schools work is that we, um, a lot of our staff were really good at expressing care and providing support, um, but sharing power and even expanding possibilities or challenging growth, that was new. Um, and so uh, we've, 
we've shared with our staff, um, you know, an activity book and some training on how to really focus on um, doing some of those practices um, in action with their students. And so by sharing power with students, we can really have the opportunity to uh, listen to them and to make sure that uh, we are serving them in the best way that we can and um, focusing on their assets and lifting up their voices and everything like that. So that was one area that I really wanted to emphasize because I know it came up. Um, I know you also asked a question around uh, data and how we're using data. So we collect, um, you know, as a part of our needs assessment process and throughout the year, we collect data on our case managed students um, based on their goals. So it could be, you know, attendance data, it could be academic data. It depends on, you know, what that particular student or school is working on into our data management system. But one of the changes that we've made in that system recently um, is to really go from a, a deficit based lens that we had in some cases. So, um, you know, when we're completing our needs assessment, we might have had things in the past that said, like, you know, inconsistent rules for students, high teacher turnover in the school, um, low parent engagement in the community, things like that, that, you know, while maybe necessary to note, um, could definitely be reframed in a more positive and um, community focused way. Um, so what we've done is we've gone into our um, to our needs assessments and into our data management system and we've reframed a lot of those ideas. So now we have things like um, rules and policies are applied equitably for students of all races, ethnicities and backgrounds. Um, and that would be an asset that a school might have or, you know, if not, that's an area in which the site coordinator can focus on the positive way um, to work on that in the school. Um, parents en regularly engaging with the school, um, the same school leadership and teachers return to the school year after year. So really taking some of those, um, what we might have seen as more risk factors or um, negative areas in the past and focusing instead on the flip side on the assets and positive um, areas for the community and 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 also adding um, that lens of diversity equity and inclusion to that as well so you know not just saying like yeah you know we have rules and policies that are good at the school but are they are they the same for uh, all students, are they the same for black and brown students? Are they the same for students of all genders and, and things like that? And really uh, emphasizing that as well. Thanks for sharing that Jacqueline. I love how you changed the actual system, like the data system, right? Yes. Um, sometimes we talk about changing systems, but you actually changed your system, which is incredible. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. We don't have that much time left and we thought we'd run out of time with this incredible group. So let's move on to the topic of diversity of resources and diversity of communities. So, um, so let's talk about diversity of resources that your organization or entity is bringing to the table for this year and reflect uh, that to the diversity of your communities. Can you share with us what you're planning or what's in the works to help meet the needs of your your communities this year and uh, Jesse and Jacqueline go ahead you take the mic first yeah absolutely thanks Lauren I, I think um, you know as I referenced earlier this this year of re-engagement um, that we just made it through and that we're headed into another year of re-engagement the focus there um, is is our big focus for the year ahead um, so looking at refreshing resources that we had created kind of in the middle or the beginning of the pandemic, thinking about how do we re-engage students who are either fully disengaged or on their way to fully disengaged. Um, and, and I will just note, you know, I, I might, in a previous life, I worked in disaster mental health. And, and one of the things that we really emphasize there, and, and Dr. Green, you were referencing this, it's, it's not just the students who've gone through the trauma, right? It's every adult in that school building, it's every adult in that community and at varying levels. So um, a lot of our supports and resources aren't just focused on the student, but also kind of thinking about going out one 
and two and three steps further, how do we re-engage with families and parents and caregivers? How do we re-engage with, with the adults in the building and really emphasize those SEL competencies, which we know when adults in the building don't have those competencies themselves, it's really hard for students to learn them. And so how do we bridge that gap as a nonprofit organization who is a partner inside of the school building? How do we equip our site coordinators with the tools, resources, um, and really practices to re-engage students and families, but also the other adults in the building when we've all gone through this pretty collective universal trauma together? Um, so some of those ways um, are we've created some pretty simple tools. And I saw this in the, in the chat box too, sort of like, what are the actual strategies? What can we actually be doing? Um, our, some of our affiliates created emergency family needs assessments. So, you know, basic needs have to be met um, before we can get into what are your big goals for your future? We've got to talk basic needs. So that's a big item for our site coordinators as we connect with students. We're also asking those next level questions about how is it, how's it at home? What's going on with your family? Are there needs that aren't being addressed at home? Um, so emergency family needs assessment are a very tangible tool of something we created. Um, that our affiliate network are using to really just check in with families. Um, we've been doing things like porch visits, drive up, drive up visits with our students and families. You know, we had to get very creative with students not being in the school building. And so how do we take those lessons from this last year and where in some pockets, I'll say the diversity of our network is really broad. So we're in 26 states um, and we work in rural communities, suburban communities, urban communities. We work in huge cities like Houston, Texas and Chicago. Um, Illinois, but we also work in Coweta County, Georgia. So um, there are a full gamut of how we approach our work. And, and as a national office, we really have to think about how do we make resources and tools that are tailorable um, for the communities in which we're serving. Um, and part of that is we really lean on the experts who are working in those communities. And we say, how have you navigated the last year? So again, um, emergency family needs assessments, porch visits are one way that they've adapted. Um, we have something called re-engagement coordinators we're using this year. And so we have a traditional site coordinator inside the school who's working with those students and families on their caseload and school-wide tier one services, and then partnering a re-engagement coordinator with that site coordinator. And that person's role is solely to focus on students that are fully disengaged. So they are going out into the community, they are tracking those students down, and they're making um, those relationships and those connections central to their uh, work with those students and families to say, again, in the sharing power, what does success look like to you? So it may not be getting to graduation day, it might be a GED or another technical skill that they're looking for. You know, a lot of students we know, and, and especially in the high school um, age ranges, dropped out because they needed to start supporting the family. Their work, they had to pick up a job or two. And so we we want to meet them where they are and acknowledge that's what they're you know dealing with. And how can we help equip them in the same way that we would if they were in a traditional school setting. And so those are just a couple of the I'm I'm sort of like looking over at my notes. We have a lot of different resources and tools. Some of them are available on our website. I'd really encourage folks to go check those out um, at communitiesandschools.org. But um, for us it's really thinking about how do we meet the community where they are? Who are the partners in the community uh, that we already have relationships with? And where do we need to build those relationships to meet the needs at the school level, but also at that individual student and family level as we think about re-engagement this school year? Incredible. So we just have a moment left. So I'm actually going to, I can't believe it went that fast, oh, right? I just want to, I'm going to chime so in. Don't worry, Dr. Green. Moment, Green. So one um, thing. Because I'm going to give you closing remarks. Go ahead, Dr. Green, wrap it up with your closing remarks as well. You know what, Jesse, you hit the nail on the head. I love this work that you and Jacqueline are doing, including the family because that that is the core of a student right is their is their family right we are secondary to them and so in in the department of education this healing centered work that we are doing mm -hmm. i'm so i was so excited when i heard about this we actually um have this initiative called the family and community wellness collective that we've started where we are actually putting healing family healing ambassadors um in schools where we are partnering with Dr. Sean Jenright around healing centered schools. And we have literally trained over 800 parents and parent leaders, um, I think earlier this month or, or late last month, just around this work, because we know that if we can create families that are healing, then we know that we are on the right track of healing our students and the ways in which they can show up. And it just makes everything collective in terms of every, 
I guess, um, intersection in who shows up for these young people that we're all speaking the same language. So I love hearing about the work that you all are doing. I love the work that we're doing in New York City. And I'm grateful to Harmony for this partnership so that we can continue to expound around this work of relationship building. Thank you so, so much. We're so grateful to have each of you with us today, sharing your stories, your experience, all your incredible work that you're doing to support children to lead happy and healthy lives. You've just underscored so many ways your organizations are doing that. So thank you so much to our panelists. Here is their contact information, so please stay in touch. Clearly, we have a lot more to say, so I think our phones are open, our emails are as well. Um, and just to keep you all informed again, thanks for, for being here. We have some exciting upcoming webinars. We also have a back to school resource toolkit that we'll be sharing this week, highlighting uh, Harmony SEL and Inspire Resources to support this critical time as you are all rebuilding uh, your school communities. We invite you to join us for a live webinar on September 1st um, when we dive into these, the new toolkit and we can share how uh, you can use these resources today. You'll, you will receive uh, an email about this webinar for registration. We also look forward to our next regularly scheduled monthly webinar, um, and this will be on September 23rd at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific time for Eastern, and this is uh, titled Cultivating Joyous and Just educational spaces for all with CCSO National Teacher of the Year, Juliana Ertbe. Well, we thank you once again. Once this web webinar comes to a close, a survey will launch on your screen. It will be very short and we would really appreciate your feedback if you're able to give it. We do read feedback and we take it very seriously and we have improved tremendously because of your great feedback. Um, so thank you. We encourage you to connect with us on social and uh, anywhere you might find us today. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.